Hi, time for the mini lecture and I'll share my screen. And let's pick up where we left off. When we left off yesterday, we had this program where we're using variables and it's okay, it works as advertised. But if we wanna change somebody to having a different age, we have to have them change the program. And that's not really ideal. As we said yesterday at the conclusion, what we'd really like is we'd really like to be able to ask the user, hey, how old are you? And then when they tell us, we use what they tell us in the calculation. In order to do that, we need to do input. And we do input with something called a scanner. Now, it turns out that Java has a lot of little libraries of code to help us do stuff. Not everything is built into Java. One of the things that's not built into Java is a way to do input. So we have to say import, and we're going to import a library from the Java util library package, and it's going to be called capital S scanner. Your import always, always, always goes at the beginning of your program. Now what we need to do is we need to connect this scanner to the keyboard so that the scanner knows, hey, we want to do input from the user's keyboard. The way we do it is to create a scanner object, and we'll call it input. And that's going to be a new scanner based on system.in. System.in is a special object that's built into Java that is connected to your keyboard. So I'm saying take the keyboard and make a new scanner based on that and save it in a variable called input. Remember, just like I have integer years, I give the data type, the variable name, and the value. My data type is scanner. My variable name is input. And its value is this new connection to the keyboard. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to system.out.print and not go to a new line. How many years old are you? And then here, instead of putting 48, I'm going to say input.nextint. And that tells the scanner input to read the next integer that the user gives us. Whatever that integer is, will go into years. Then we'll use those years times 365 to calculate the days and print that out. Let's compile that and let's run it. And now it says, how many years old are you? And it's waiting for my input. So if let's say I have somebody who's 23 years old, they type 23 and press enter, and it calculates their age in years, and days, excuse me. Let's run it again. Let's say somebody comes in who's, uh, I don't know, 19 years old. And then somebody else can run it, and maybe they're 80 years old. And that'll tell them approximately how many days old they are. So now we have a very nice generic program that will work for anybody. A couple of things to note here. I used print here instead of print ln. Gee, I wonder what would happen if I did use print ln. Let's compile and run it. And now my input cursor, where I put the age, is on a separate line from the prompt. The By prompt, I mean the text that tells the user what to input. There's nothing particularly wrong about it. The program will still work fine, but it's ugly. I always want the cursor to be on the same line as my prompt. Now, you'll also notice that I put a blank here after the question mark. Why did I do that? Let's take it out and see what happens. And by the way, I'm going to go back to same line here. And again, the program still works, but again, it's a little bit ugly. This number is too close to the question mark. 
And that's why I'm putting in this extra blank here because that gives me some breathing room for my cursor. And that's how we do input. There's one other thing I wanna do here. I created the connection to the keyboard. When I'm done with my program, I'm going to say input.close, which is closes down the scan. It breaks the connection with the keyboard. You don't have to do that. When your program ends, the system will automatically close it. But the reason I have put it in there is because on some integrated development environments, if you don't say that you are closing the input, you'll get a little warning message. It'll say, you didn't close your input. Yeah, okay, fine. So this explicitly closes it. That's input. Let me take a quick look here at what else is in chapter three here. Oh, literals and constants. I think we talked about that earlier. Namely, um, did I use constants here before last time? I don't remember. Oh, yes, I did. Cool. Okay, so what I might want to do, just for grins, I might want to say um, final integer days per year becomes 365, and then here, days per year. Yeah, to make things a little bit nicer. Cool. Let's go with purchase.java. And now we want the per the I the um price of the item. Well, in this case, we don't want it to be always $12.95. So we're going to say in this time, oh, I guess we're gonna need our scanner again, aren't we? We're gonna to have to import java.util.scanner. And we're going to have to put our scanner in here. And um, I'm going to put it there, scanner input becomes a new scanner object connected to the keyboard. And then when I'm done with my program, I'm going to close my input. You know what? I'm going to be doing this a lot because I'm almost always going to be asking for input from now on. Time to change my template. That way I don't have to retype this every single time. And and just for cleanliness, I'm going to get rid of some of these extra blank lines that aren't helping me any. And I just want to compile this to make sure that it compiles okay. And when I run it, yeah, it doesn't do anything, but that's cool. I've got a good program here. Let's go back to purchase. Now, in this case, first of all, and now this is an error that I see a lot. I'll say, okay, we want input.next double. And let's compile that and run it. And now it's waiting for input, but I forgot the prompt. So how do I know what I'm supposed to enter? So always remember to put up a prompt. So here, let's go and put here um, system.out.print, enter the item price. Now here, I'm not putting the extra space and there's a reason and you're gonna see why. Well, because I want the numbers to be right after the dollar sign. Although if you do put the blank in there, I'm not going to complain. If you want to be consistent and always put a blank in there, if you think it looks better this way. I'm perfectly happy with that. So there we have our input. And I'm putting in some blank lines here so the things that belong together are grouped together. There we go. And let's see what else I need to talk about here. Oh, typecasts and error messages and a whole bunch of other stuff. Oh my goodness, okay.
Formatting output, though, that's important. So let's go on to formatting output here. Um, when I run this program, you'll notice I get this really ugly business here. I would like to have things as exactly two digits after the decimal point. The way I'm going to do this, instead of using print LN, I'm going to use print F. So I'm going to, actually, let's, let's stop here for a moment. I'm going to save, I save this under a different name so that we, we can have purchase with format.java. Purchase with format. We're going to use print F, which means print with formatting. And what we do is our first argument, the first thing that we call put inside the parentheses is going to be a format string. What we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to want the words, your item cost and a dollar sign. And then we're going to say, I want a placeholder, a fill in the blank and a percent sign introduces a placeholder. Then we would say, how do we want that placeholder formatted when we print it out? And the answer is we want dot two, which means two digits after the decimal point and F because this is a floating point number. Then we are also going to say percent sign N, which means new line. So let me put a comment in here for that. Percent sign dot two F means floating point number with two digits after the decimal. And percent sign N means give me a new line. The reason we have to do that is because printf does not give you a new line. It's not like println. It's more like print. So if we want a new line, we have to put it in ourselves. Let's compile that. And run it. Oh. Try compiling it. There we go. And running it. And now, by the way, if I say something like 34.1, Notice it gives me my two digits. How cool is that? And we'll do that. That comes out to, we're going to need a, also another percent sign dot 2F, percent sign N. We'll put a period here. This period here is not part of the format. It's a period to end the sentence. So here's our format string. We'll change this to a print F. It says that comes out to this. And then after the format string comes the thing we want to print. Let's compile that. And if we have $34.95, notice we get only two digits after the decimal point. Now I need to work on this second line here. And we're going to again say percent dot two F, percent sign N. comma tax. Now, what happens when I compile this? It compiles successfully, but when I run it, I get a conversion mismatch exception. This is what's called a runtime error. What I did in Java we didn't have a syntax error. We've seen those before. Like if I leave off a quote mark or if I put in too many parentheses, the compiler will stop us right away. We won't even be able to run the program. Uh, let me show you an example of that. So if I had accidentally put a closing parenthesis here and compiled it, it would say, well, I'm not even going to let you run this program, dude. It's wrong. Yeah. But everything I've done here has been syntactically correct. The grammar and spelling, so to speak, in Java is perfect. The problem is when I try to run the program, it can't run it because there's some problem when I run the program and you get this thing called an exception. And we'll talk about exceptions much later in the semester. Now, some of these are very weird and confusing and you're gonna see a whole bunch of stuff here. And one of the things in there is always going to be your program. 
So it says, okay, this happened in purchase with format. It happened in the main method and it happened on line 27. And the problem is I can't format this correctly. And the reason is on line 27 here, because remember I said percent sign introduces a placeholder and then I have to follow it with what kind of thing there is. Oh no, I have a percent sign here and there's nothing to follow it. It thinks I have a placeholder. So the question is, how do I get a real honest to gosh percent sign? And the answer is I put two percent signs in a row, which means give me a percent sign. This is not a placeholder. So if I put two percent signs in a row here, now when I compile this and run it for $34.95, I get my seven and a half percent there, which is exactly what I want. And I get two decimal points for everything, which is, a, again, exactly what I wanted. You know what? This seven and a half, remember, oh, wait a minute. It's not seven and a half, it's 7.75. Oh, bummer. We want to print the tax rate and the tax here. So now I have two placeholders. My first placeholder will be filled in by tax rate. These percent signs are not a placeholder. And my second placeholder, this percent dot two F will be filled in by the tax. Oh, we had a problem here. Okay, good. I'm I'm glad I made this. This, oh, this is perfect. This is exact. I did not do this intentionally, but boy, did this work out great. Wait a minute. This is 7.75% and it comes out as 0.08%. What the heck went wrong here? Okay. What I have here is called a logic error. In fact, let me write these three kinds of errors. We have a syntax error. That's sort of like grammar spelling. And that is uh, things like missing semicolon, too many parentheses, et cetera. Compiler catches these for you. We have a runtime error. And that is the syntax is correct. But when you run the program, Java can't do what you told it to do. That's when we had that percent sign hanging out in the middle of nowhere. Java couldn't handle it. And the last kind, the hardest one to fix is a logic error. The syntax is correct. Java can do what you told it. But what you told it isn't what you really want to do. Seven point seven five divided by one hundred works out to zero point zero seven five, but I don't want zero point zero seven five percent. I need to multiply that by a hundred. That's a logic error. I'm printing the wrong thing. I don't need the tax rate because I'm printing a percent sign instead of a decimal here. I need to multiply by a hundred to convert it to a percent. That's the whole definition of percent. So there's my logic error, which I now think I have corrected. I have $50. And there's my 7.75% tax. Yes, it works. The last thing I'm going to do to this program is I'm going to make this one long print, one printf instead of a whole bunch of printfs. I'm going to appear here with percent dot two f 
tax of dollar sign percent dot two F percent N. That comes out two percent sign dollar sign percent dot two F percent. Oh, I don't need a percent sign in here. Yeah. Now I have a lot of placeholders, so I have to fill them all in. The price is the first one. The tax rate times 100 fills in this. The tax that I calculated here on line 19 fills in this placeholder. And the total fills in my last placeholder. And let me see if I can get rid of all this. And my period is outside of the percent sign N. I screwed that up a little bit here. The percent sign has to come at the very end. There we go. That'll 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 fix that. Violet. And that's formatting. Oh gosh, I guess we can do some formatting here as well. So instead of using all this plus signs, we can say printf your age of percent sign D years is about percent sign D days old. And then a percent N. And we're gonna fill that in with the years and the days. In this case, percent sign D is used for an integer. Now there's a lot of other stuff that you can do with formatting. And let me see if I can find it here under pages. View all pages. Actually, I want to go back here. Let me just check something here real quick. I want to do this in student view. I want to make sure, sure it works for, for the student. <laughs> so if I go here to pages. Yeah, okay, you can view all pages too. How wonderful. Somewhere down here we have, uh, let's see, where was it here? Formatting output. There we go. And this will give you another recap of this. So if the, you got confused by my mini lecture, no problem. You can um, go through here and you can read it at your, at your leisure. Now, this is using backslash n instead of percent sign n. So I may as well put that in here to let you know. Let's do this here. Backslash n also gives a new line, but percent sign n is preferable. So I, I I wrote that page about formatting output before I learned about percent sign n. So this is wonderful. That means I now have come back and covered this thing in chapter two about compiler error messages and other types of errors. Knew I would be able to find that eventually. We've talked about the remainder operator. I talked about reading error messages here. Um, and finally, we want type cast operators. So let's do this. Let's, um, oh, let's use our template. Now that I have my template, I can use that, hooray. And let's call this average sale.java. And here's what we're gonna do. We're going to ask the user how many um, people bought items 
and how many items were sold total. And then we will print the average uh, number of items per person which we want to have decimal places in. So there's the purpose of my program. And because I called it average sale.java, this has to be called average sale. So we're going to say system.out.print. You know what? No, stop, 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 stop. Let's plan this program. Let's write down the steps that we're going to have to do. Step one is prompt the user for the number of people. Read it into a variable. What should we call it? Uh, how about call it n people, number of people. Not the best variable name in the world, but it'll do. Then we need to prompt user for total number of items sold. Step four will be to read that into a variable called items sold. Now what we need to do is we need to calculate the average as items sold divided by n people. And then print the average properly labeled. So those are our steps. Now you're saying, oh my gosh, why are you going through all this fancy schmancy rigmarole for a simple program like this? And the answer is because I want you all to get in the habit of planning your program before you write it. So there's six steps we have to go through here. Okay, step one, prompt for um, the number of people. How many people bought items? And then we're going to have an integer called number of people becomes uh, input.nextint. Then we're going to do our step three. How many items total did you sell? And then we're going to say our integer, this is step four, items sold becomes um, input.nextint also. Now I'm going to have an average, which is a double, because remember, I want to have the decimal point. Double average is going to become items sold divided by the number of people. And then I can say print F, average items per person is percent sign dot one F. I'm going to have one digit after the decimal point. And then a period to end the sentence, a percent n, and I'm going to fill in the blank with average. Yeah. And let's compile that and let's run it. And so how many people bought items? Let's say I had five people bought items and they had 17 items so, so total. Uh, no, that's not right. I don't want 3.0. It should be 3.4, I believe. Okay, because I, I want an accurate average. So the question is, how do I get that to happen? Here's my problem. This is an integer, and that's an integer. Remember, 17 divided by 5 is 3 not 3.4. And that's why I lost it. Even though I'm assigning it to a double on the left-hand side, remember this happens first. So I'm taking integer 17 divided by integer five, which gives me integer three, and that gets promoted to 3.0, which is not what I want. So the question is, how do I make this a double? Here's one way to do it. I could say 1.0 times items sold divided by n people. Now, because I have a double times an integer, that gets promoted to a double. And as soon as I have a double, everything else is a double. So I have 17 people, five. Uh, 
Okay, I got that. I got those backwards. Okay, let's try that again. Uh, I have five people buying 17 items. There we go. And now I get my 3.4. Cool, that's what I wanted. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is something called a cast. And this is in the book here in chapter um, three called Type Cast Operators. And what we're going to do here is we are going to say, this is going to say, take items sold and convert it to a double. Then when we divide it by an integer, we're going to be cool. Everything is going to still come out as a double. I have people bought 17 items and 3.4. I could also do cast them both. It wouldn't hurt. So I can take the double item sold divided by double n people. So I have five people bought 17 items. Now, once I've got a double, by the way, I do not have to do casts anymore. I don't have to say double average. It already is one. So don't go overboard with these casts, please. Now, you've got to be careful. I'm going to tell you this right now. If you do this, then all of a sudden that undoes all your work. Because what happens now is I'm going to do the items in parentheses first, which will be 17 integer divided by integer 5, which is integer 3, and then I'll promote it to double 3.0, which is not what I wanted. Then I'm right back where I started. So be careful when you use casts that you cast the right things. Um, speaking of which, let me go into here. Ah. Rachel. The other kind of, you can cast things to other data types. For example, let's say I have a double X and I set to 37.9. And I say int um, whole number is going to be int x. That says convert x to an integer. This is, again, I'm casting x to be an integer. And that will not round. Instead, what it will do is it will get rid of the decimal part entirely. So here's a cast to integer. And here I have, let's say, um, integer A is 12. Integer B is, uh, let's say, 7. And then I can say double C is double A divided by B. Again, I don't have to, all if, as long as there's one item that's a double, the whole thing is going to be a double. But what the heck? So here I'm casting to a double to make everything work out right. I think this pretty much covers what we need to know in chapters two and three. Um, you may want to look at this thing called the scanner bug. It's really not a bug. It's just the way the scanner is built. Read this at your leisure. It's not going to come up in any of the in the assignment. Let me just do a real quick look at what the assignment is, though. Dum -dum 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 -dum. And the assignment is going to be variables. So here we have a staircase made of concrete, as shown in this diagram. There's four steps. There's the width, the run, and the rise. Those are the dimensions that you need to know when you're building a staircase. And we want to know the volume of this staircase because we're building it out of concrete. How much concrete will we need? We're going to need a cast, by the way, here. Um,
to figure out the volume, what we want to know is we, we, we can figure out that the volume of one of these blocks here, like this bottom block, is the width times the run times the rise. That's the volume of this bottom block. Now, on the second step, we have one block, two blocks, don't we? And on the third step, we're going to need three blocks stacked on top of each other. And for the fourth step, we're going to need four blocks. So we're going to need four plus three plus two plus one, which is 10 blocks altogether. So the question is, how many blocks the size of the bottom step do you need to build a staircase? And you can draw a diagram that will really help you. If you have n number of steps, the total number of blocks is the sum of the numbers one through n. If I had five steps in the staircase, I need one plus two plus three plus four plus five for the fifth step. To get the sum, I can calculate it with, that would be five times six, which is 30 divided by two, I need 15 blocks. So here is your, what the program output might look like. You're gonna ask the user how many steps in the staircase you're gonna to need to use a scanner. They'll tell you that. Now, is that gonna be an integer or is it gonna be a double? Well, my question is, can you have 3.79 steps in a staircase? Probably not. So we probably it's going to be an integer. For the width, the rise, and the run in centimeters, could those be double or are they integers? Well, the answer is here. Since I'm using 7.5, yeah, I should expect to have decimal points or double for the rise, the width, and the run. And then the total volume is going to be an integer. And there's some style hints here for doing user input. And it talks about doing the prompts, printing blank lines again, and blank lines in source code. So you'll definitely want to read this so that your style is nice. And the reason you want to do that is because that's worth two points is your programming style. And that, I think, is going to do our um, mini lecture for tonight. What I'm going to do tomorrow, if I have a mini lecture, is I might just do a couple of programs um, from the Extra Exercises book, or I'll just make up some new exercises so that I will practice these things. And by the way, you should practice these things as well. And I'll see you all around.